A day that began with a class field trip ended with a parent's worst nightmare. Family and friends worked with local police and the FBI in an urgent search for a missing daughter. An unlikely suspect eventually emerged in the girl's disappearance. Faced with conflicting testimony, the FBI would need to rely on forensic evidence to convict a predator. Parents of 11-year-old Brittany Martinez knew their daughter was no runaway, but that was all they knew. Something had happened to her, something terrible. When they failed to find Brittany in their quiet Illinois neighborhood, they called the police. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. The FBI was soon brought in to grapple with conflicting witness reports, false leads, and a lack of clues. Agents wouldn't stop until they found Brittany and the truth. Chicago, Illinois and its surrounding suburbs are home to roughly 10 million residents of various backgrounds and income. People settled here to take advantage of Chicago's economic and cultural opportunities. Families from Chicago's nearby suburb of Elgin were no exception. At about 5 p.m. on May 8, 1997, Wendy Howlett returned to Elgin with her five-year-old son and her 11-year-old daughter, Brittany Martinez, after enjoying the day at Chicago's Shedd Aquarium. The mother of two had chaperoned her daughter's fifth grade class on a field trip to the famous institution. She was just all excited about her field trip to the Shedd Aquarium. And I had five of her girlfriends with me. They had a great time. They liked the sharks, the turtles. We had lunch outside, seen the boats, seen planes going by. Brittany just had a wonderful time. Brittany and her friends were eager to play outside on the first warm day of spring. The fifth grader was her mother's eldest from a previous marriage. While upstairs with her son, Wendy heard her daughter call up from the street. Brittany asked if she could go to a nearby park. I looked down the window and she was looking up and I said, no, you can't go, you know, because I thought she was maybe just going with one friend and she actually went with five and I'm like, okay, there's a group, you can go. Just be back by six o'clock. The park was only two blocks away. Her son was too young to go with them, so Wendy offered to take him to his Aunt Pam's new house for a short visit. Since Pam lived in the neighborhood, the walk would be brief. On the way out, Wendy left Brittany a note, then bumped into her downstairs neighbor. She told him that if he saw Brittany return before six o'clock, her daughter had two options, wait for her mother upstairs or come to her Aunt Pam's house alone. 45 minutes later, Wendy had returned from Pam's without seeing Brittany. She figured she was still at the park with her friends. Wendy fixed a quick meal for her son while she waited for her brother to pick her up for work. At about 20 after 6, her husband, Scott Howlett, came home from his job. Scott would watch the kids when Wendy worked part-time in the evenings with her brother as a custodian. And he walked in and I said, well, I gotta go to work now. Brittany's at the park with her friends. And he looked at me and said, no, she's not. Her friends are outside. Wendy's heart sank. She went to the window to check with Brittany's friends. And they all looked up at me and said, she went on her bike to Aunt Pam's house to where you are. I said, well, I'm home. Have you seen her since? They're like, no. 
Brittany's friends said they'd returned from the park a little while ago. Wendy called her sister-in-law, Pam. Hey, Pam. You seen Brittany? No, no, I saw her in the park. About half an hour ago. But Brittany had not shown up yet. The family went off in search of her. It wasn't normal for Brittany not to call me. From like 6 to 6.30, I'd normally know where she's at. So that was unusual to begin with for my daughter not to be in contact with me. It also wasn't like Brittany to be out alone. In a few hours, it would be dark. My husband left to start searching on foot, thinking maybe she could have been at this park still, on the way to Aunt Pam's or something. We didn't know. When we didn't find her by like 8 o'clock, a mother's instinct, I knew there was a problem. Wendy called 911. Elgin patrol units were immediately dispatched. Sergeant Robert Beter of the Elgin Police Department was a detective at the time. He knew that when police respond quickly, they usually find the minor unharmed. Anytime we receive a phone call regarding a missing child, it's, we take it pretty seriously. Initially, we make contact with the people who call us. In every case, we normally search the residence, the person's residence, inside, uh, just in case, cover the bases in case the person is hiding under the bed or in the closet, and that's happened in the past. That wasn't the case with Brittany. Wendy told officers that her daughter was last seen wearing jeans, a blue T-shirt, yellow socks and white sneakers. Police had to consider the possibility that Brittany had simply run away. They started asking me about my daughter, and they're like, well, are you sure she's not at her friend's house? I said, the friends she would have been at, they're right there. Um, they started asking me, are you sure she didn't run away? Was she angry? Was she mad? I'm like, no, she was, we had an awesome day all day. She was with her friends. And it's not like my daughter not to notify me this long. Investigators next questioned the Howlett's downstairs neighbor. He said that Brittany and her friends came back from the park at about 5.50, 20 minutes before Wendy had returned from her sister-in-law Pam's house. The neighbor said he gave Brittany the message from her mother. She could wait upstairs or go to her Aunt Pam's alone. According to him, Brittany seemed excited about going to see her aunt. Five minutes later, the 23-year-old neighbor said he was inside his apartment when he heard Brittany struggling to drag her bicycle up the basement stairs. He went out to give the 11-year-old a hand with her bike. Once they were on the street, Brittany thanked him and rode off toward her Aunt Pam's house. The neighbor never saw her after that. As word of Brittany's disappearance spread, more police and family members continued to gather to help in the search. At around 9 o'clock, Wendy's younger brother, Eddie Milka, pulled up. Brittany's uncle was shocked by the news. He told his worried sisters that he had also seen Brittany outside the apartment at around 6 o'clock when he had stopped by to pick up Wendy for work. He'd gone to work alone when he learned Wendy wasn't home. Milka said he would go to search for his niece at the park. Investigators continued to question people who lived close by, hoping someone had seen something that could point them in the right direction. But no one else had seen the 11-year-old on her bike after she left her house. Neighbors were reporting no type of disturbance or any unusual activity in the neighborhood. It was a very nice day, kids out playing. Uh, there was just no signs of, of her being taken from the scene by force. Um, so we were, we were very concerned. Brittany! The searchers fanned out in every possible direction the fifth grader could have wandered. Brittany! They began in the park where Brittany and her friends had been playing. A helicopter joined overhead. Brittany! 
Other volunteers searched dumpsters and alleys in the area. Brittany and her bicycle seemed to have disappeared without a trace. As the night wore on, the searchers straggled back, weary and discouraged. Wendy remained at home, hoping for news on her daughter's whereabouts. During that search, I wanted to go out and help search, and they advised me that I should stay home just in case she called, or maybe it could have been a ransom or whatever. So I stayed home as hard as it was, and no phone calls, no nothing. My husband, my mom, my sisters, they were all out searching here, going to parks. Um, they continue to search all night. Wendy did her best to remain composed. But after six hours of fruitless searching, the mother was distraught. She was very upset, uh, very emotional, uh, very concerned, just at wit's end, um, just didn't know where to turn. Uh, we tried to reassure her that, you know, we're doing everything we can. Uh, we're not going to give up on this. We're going to keep going and going and going until we find her. Once again, investigators turned their attention to the interior of the building for clues. In the basement, they were surprised to find Brittany's bike. The chain was unsecured. It wasn't like Brittany to leave it unlocked. So, you heard it? The bike was Brittany's prized possession. The neighbor told police he never saw Brittany return after she rode off. Investigators believe that the bike must have been returned before 6.20 when Scott Howlett, Brittany's stepfather, came home from work. Hoping for a lead, several officers returned to the station to search the database. Illinois state law requires that all convicted child molesters register with the local police. Investigators sought past offenders whose records might point to a likely suspect. Obviously, your number one concern would be if there's anybody in the area that would be, that could be prone to this type of behavior, taking a, uh, a, a young child. So we, we naturally assume, let's just cover the base with sex offenders. They discovered that a registered sex offender was known to reside a few blocks away from the missing girl's apartment. Local officers knew the man was currently homeless and lived in his van. They also knew where he usually parked at night. If the missing girl was inside, Investigators didn't want to provoke him to do anything desperate. Brittany was not there. Nothing inside indicated Brittany had ever been in the van. He claimed to have no knowledge of the missing girl and gave the detectives an account of his activities that day. His alibi checked out. No, oh, thank you. Have a nice night. Officers re-interviewed family and friends in the slim hope that they might offer something new that could help. Wendy's parents, Brittany's maternal grandparents, lived a few miles away with their 20-year-old son, Eddie Milka. No one had seen Brittany since Eddie had at about 6 o'clock. The family believed Eddie was one of the last persons to see her. We wanted to find out further information that Brittany might have relayed to him that she was going somewhere, or maybe he dropped her somewhere or something, anything that he might have been able to tell us. Eddie Milka appeared tired, but detectives wanted to get a more detailed statement while his memory was still fresh. When police asked him to provide one back at the station, the missing girl's uncle was offended. He blurted out, why do you guys think I took Brittany? Um, we were kind of taken aback by that because it was an unusual statement. Um, there was, we weren't accusing him of anything, we were just asking for his help. Despite the offense and the late hour, Eddie agreed to talk to them at the station. Anything to help investigators locate Brittany. 
Come up and take a look at your car. Sure. He also allowed police to search the car he'd been driving what to quell what whatever doing? suspicions they may have had. In that type of a search, you'd take a look and see if anything would, would uh, draw your attention to the car. Maybe some item of clothing that she was wearing at the time. Not that we expected to find that in there, but um, we need to explore all avenues. There was a garbage can in the back seat of the car. Um, there was a vacuum cleaner in the trunk of the car. And it didn't surprise us because Wendy had told us that that's what they do. Uh, she and Eddie clean places um, at night generally. Eddie accompanied the police to the station. Detectives hoped he'd have the answers they needed to find his missing niece. Brittany Martinez was still out there, somewhere, and investigators didn't know if she was dead or alive. In the early morning hours of May 9, 1997, Wendy Howlett's 11-year-old daughter, Brittany Martinez, had been missing from her Elgin, Illinois home for almost 11 hours. Extensive searches and interviews through the night had turned up no trace of the missing girl. Desperate, Wendy Howlett reached out to the community for help. We called the Polyclass organization. They sent us information and what to do and what procedures to follow to get her picture on the internet for those missing and exploited children. We started calling any of the news channels to see if they can get her picture on TV to see if someone maybe seen her. If one news station said no, we called the next one. Chicago morning news programs broadcast appeals to the public to be on the lookout for the brown-haired 11-year-old. Authorities set up a hotline, hoping for the call that would lead them to Brittany. Like many in the community, Elgin Police Detective Robert Beter was deeply troubled by the case. This investigation was particularly difficult because of uh, it involved a small child. She was 11 years old, and actually at the time, my son, my oldest son, was 11 years old, and it kind of hit home. Um, when you first get these cases, 99 times out of 100, you can find the person rather quickly. So as time goes on, it just, it just became very draining um, to try, try to determine where this person's at. Okay, Eddie, tell me what happened that evening. Racing against time, detectives turned to Brittany's uncle, Eddie Milka, for help. Although the 20-year-old janitor had been up all night, detectives asked him to detail what he could remember about the last time he saw his niece. He said that at around 6 p.m., he arrived to pick up Brittany's mother, Wendy, who was supposed to help him clean a building that night. Eddie recalled seeing his niece outside with her bike. He asked where her mother was. Brittany said that her mother was not home. Eddie couldn't wait for his sister. He had to be at work, so he said goodbye, hugged his niece, then left at around 6.15. He said he wasn't sure if Brittany had taken her bike inside afterwards. At about 6.45, Eddie stopped at a convenience store to buy a pack of cigarettes before work. He stayed at work until 8.30 and discovered that Brittany was missing at about 9.00. He had searched two parks that night where he knew Brittany often played. But like the rest of the family, he turned up nothing. Afterwards, he stopped by the house of some friends and admitted smoking marijuana with them. Now he was exhausted and wanted to get some sleep. At some point in the interview, he said, listen guys, you're just gonna have to let me go because I don't have anything else to tell you. I'm tired, I wanna go home. Um, and at this point, it was like a three-hour interview. And we didn't, have, we didn't have any reason to keep him there, so then we brought him home. With time working against them, Elgin police contacted the Chicago field office of the FBI. That was pretty recent. From experience, FBI Special Agent Beth Malarkey knew that if Brittany was not found in the first 24 hours, the girl's chances of survival were slim. The initial hours are incredibly crucial. We all know in law enforcement and having worked previous kidnapping cases that the longer the child goes missing, the less likelihood there is of recovering the child, certainly alive. 
and our mission is to recover a live child. The FBI offered local authorities additional manpower, plus a computer system that helped organize cross-reference and manage leads. These resources became increasingly valuable as calls flooded in. There were hundreds of leads that were called in by the public because of a, a number that was disseminated to the public for anyone having information. All of those leads were cataloged and checked. People's alibis were checked. Investigators decided to follow up on Eddie Milka's alibi as well. They spoke to the president of the company whose building Eddie was scheduled to clean the night before. The executive had worked late that night and saw no one else in the building. When he locked up at 8.15, the president's car was the only one in the lot. Investigators also checked the convenience store where Milka said he bought cigarettes. The store was equipped with a 24-hour surveillance camera. The detective scanned the video recorded on May 8th from 6 to 8 p.m. He never saw Brittany's uncle enter the store. Eddie Milka had lied about his whereabouts. The other family members were interviewed, and what they told us turned out to be true. All their whereabouts were accounted for. Other people were, were able to verify their statements. Everything that Edward Milka told us turned out not to be true. But the discovery that Milka had lied did not prove wrongdoing, nor did it put investigators any closer to finding the young girl. It had been almost 24 hours since Brittany was reported missing. Investigators continued to pursue all viable leads. By this time, we were just getting continuous telephone leads, people, the citizens calling in, community calling in, assisting us with, with possible information. Maybe they saw her somewhere. Witnesses reported seeing Brittany in many locations throughout the region, including a restaurant. The police dispatched officers to check each sighting. The public and investigators alike clung to hope that Brittany was still alive. Each time officers responded, they were disappointed. Police found uh, only conflicting the, stories the and unconfirmed yeah, accounts. Sure. Yeah. Right By the end of the first day, investigators were forced to consider the possibility that they were no longer looking for a live victim. May 10th, 1997, marked the second day that Elgin, Illinois police and the FBI searched for missing 11-year-old Brittany Martinez. Since Brittany had now been missing for over 36 hours, the possibility that she had met a violent end became more likely. The last person to have seen her was her uncle, Eddie Milka. Elgin detective Robert Beter could not eliminate Milka as a suspect. Eddie Milka was always a question. It was always a question on his behavior. It was always a question on his statements that he told us. And all the other leads that we were getting in, they were quickly, quickly resolved. But no one had seen Milka talking to Brittany outside her home, as Milka himself had claimed. Thanks. Elgin police detective Brian Gorkowski realized that unless Brittany or her body was recovered, investigators had no physical evidence that she'd been harmed. We suspected that this was a kidnapping maybe at some point or a child abduction, but again, we had no tangible things to say, you know, this is a murder. We had no body. We had no smoking gun, if you will. That was very difficult for me. On the morning of May 10th, Detective Gorkowski received a page from Brittany's mother, Wendy. She said that her brother, Eddie Milka, wanted to talk to police again. We wanted to re-interview Eddie Milka. We wanted him to come in and talk to us voluntarily. And if he did do that, we wanted as much information about his background, his past, as we could gather. So we were very pleased that she did give us this background. Wendy Howlett described Eddie as slow. He had attended a special high school for the learning disabled. As far as she knew, Eddie had few friends and no girlfriends. Investigators met with the 20-year-old in the police department's family interview room. You all right? Okay, yes. 
They asked him what he wanted to tell them. The detectives were pleased by Eddie Milka's response. Milka told us he had lied. I mean, initially, right off the bat in, in the beginning of this conversation, and that he was now going to tell us the truth. Well, at that point, I got a little excited because I like when someone I'm going to interview tells me they lied. Because that, at that point, I know that we can get everything behind us. We can start getting the truth out. We can be open. There can be some honest dialogue between the two of us. He admitted that when he saw Brittany, he was under the influence of marijuana. But he maintained that he had left his niece in front of her apartment at about 6.15 when he drove off to work. Milka told detectives that when he pulled into work, he saw his boss's car and wanted to avoid him since he was high. He claimed that he didn't enter the office building until 8.15 when his boss left. Detectives knew this version couldn't be true. We confronted him with the workplace lie. You weren't in the workplace at 8.15 p.m. We know that because the owner said there was no one inside that business when he had left. Milko told us, you know, you, you might be right. Um, there may be some time difference here. But Milka didn't elaborate. If he knew where Brittany was, he wasn't forthcoming. Investigators tried a new tack. I asked him to imagine where Brittany was at this point in time because he was the last one to see her. He began to rub his temples, he closed his eyes, and then he said she was in Elgin, then she was near Elgin, that she was cold and wet. He continued to reiterate that constantly. We asked if she was breathing, he said that she was not. We asked if she was bleeding. He told us, no, she wasn't bleeding. Milka asked for a cigarette. I just, I know she's dead. And I he started pacing and mumbling, then asked the detective to write down what he was about to say. Milka claimed he was having a vision of Brittany in an old gray car with two men who were drinking beer. He also saw farmhouses, a dirt road, gravel, rocks, and a creek. He added that the men had touched her all over, but he didn't stop there. After he had told me that he had seen these two uh, males touching Brittany, he then told me, I know she's dead, I want to tell my sister she's dead, grabbed me, hugged me, and began to cry. Wendy Howard was called down to the station. She noticed her brother had been crying and asked what he had to tell her. Once again, Eddie Milka changed his story. He just looked up at me and said, I didn't do it. I don't, you know, they're putting things in my head. I just want to go home. I just want to go home. They're telling me Brittany's dead. Brittany's still alive. We got to find her. Since Milka never admitted any wrongdoing in his vision statement, police had nothing to hold him on. Wendy took her brother home. Investigators questioned the two friends Milka said he had smoked marijuana with on the day Brittany disappeared. They confirmed that they'd been with Eddie until 10 minutes to 6 when he left for work. Milka told them that he would be back later to watch the Bulls game. When he returned at approximately 10.30 that night, Milka was upset and crying. He told them that his niece, Brittany, was missing. They then drank a few beers and watched the rest of the Bulls game. Eddie left their house at about 1 a.m. The friends had nothing more to add. Investigators still had no evidence that Milka had abducted Brittany and no clue as to where she might be now. And then, you know, a week goes by and we still haven't determined what happened to her. She could have been fined somewhere. She could have been taken and then released. And that's how some of these cases work out. Some of the more, uh, the more dangerous ones, the person takes them and then releases them at a later time. 
On May 17, 1997, nine days after Brittany disappeared, a couple was boating on the Kishwaukee River, 18 miles outside of Elgin, when they made a grisly discovery. They found the body of a girl washed up on a sandbar. She was naked from the waist up and severely decomposed. The terrified couple made for shore and then ran to call the police. On May 17, 1997, nine days after 11-year-old Brittany Martinez was reported missing from her Elgin, Illinois home, a young girl's body was discovered 18 miles away in the Kishwaukee River. Lieutenant Jean Lowry of the McHenry County Sheriff's Department investigated. At the time, we weren't sure if it was Brittany Martinez or not. I knew from screening the missing cases that come through our jurisdiction at the Sheriff's Department, we didn't have any missing females that would be within that age range. So we begin to look outside of our jurisdiction and other, other police agencies to determine what, if any, missing persons might fit that description. Um, the nearby Elgin police and FBI were called in to determine if the dead girl was Brittany. FBI Special Agent Beth Malarkey believed they had finally found her. Those of us who were involved in the investigation and knew the description of Brittany, what she looked like, what her hair looked like, the clothes that she was wearing when she was missing. Although the body that was found on the sandbar was missing a t-shirt, the rest of it very much resembled Brittany Martinez. The dark hair, the blue jeans, the socks, and the tennis shoes that she was wearing. It was impossible to visually identify the victim or to immediately determine how she had died. Investigators could see no external wounds. Long time. They believed she had likely been killed elsewhere than dumped in the river. The mood amongst the investigators was grim. It just became very sad because the reality of having a dead child and the, investigating, the investigation changing from a missing child to possibly a murdered child um, changed the whole tone of the investigation. The surrounding area struck Detective Brian Gorkowski as similar to the place Eddie Milka had described earlier in his vision statement. The scene of the Kishwaukee River at that point seems more like a creek or a small body of water, not necessarily what you would picture a river to be. There were rocks, there was dirt roads in the area, there was farmhouses. The landscape very much uh, depicted what Eddie had told me in the vision statement. To confirm that Milka's vision statement was not a coincidence, they needed proof that could link him to this location. The FBI's evidence recovery team, specialists in crime scene forensics, were called in. It was the same unit that sifted through the debris of Pan Am Flight 103 and the Oklahoma City bombing. The ERT is very highly trained and professional and organized in how they conduct crime scene searches. And because this looked like a murder investigation at this point, every piece of evidence was gonna be extremely important. The forensic technicians took soil, water, and plant samples as well as samples of the insects that had colonized the body. Based on the development of these larvae, scientists determined that the victim died no later than 2 p.m. on May 9th, the day after Brittany disappeared. That night, Wendy Howlett prayed it wasn't Brittany. I still was trying to keep hope that it wasn't my daughter and I was hoping it was no one else. It was someone's little girl, but I was hoping it wasn't mine. Two days later, dental records confirmed that the remains were, in fact, those of Brittany Martinez. A forensic pathologist determined that she had died of asphyxiation. Two strips of tape were removed from her face and mouth. A large bruise with scalloped edges was found on her cheek. To investigators, it resembled a bite mark. The examiner noted that Brittany's jeans were only half zipped, 
and her underwear was on inside out. He found two lacerations on the hymen. The pathologist concluded that the fifth grader had been sexually assaulted immediately before or at the time of her death. It would take several more months to process Brittany's clothing and tissue samples at the FBI lab. Special Agent Malarkey wanted to make sure that the analysis was thorough. I have to say that I didn't sleep for several days after that because seeing her, seeing the state that she was in, and understanding the magnitude of what took place. Detective Robert Beter hoped the discovery of Brittany's body and clothing would provide the physical evidence they needed to catch her killer. When it was final, at that point, we could notify the families and, and really start digging our heels and focusing on uh, some of the evidence we had already recovered. For the past 11 days, Wendy Howlett had nourished the hope that her child was still alive. Now, that hope was dashed. The Howlett's worst fears had come true. When they told me that it was my daughter, it is the worst feeling that you ever want to know. I can't even describe the pain that it goes through because that was my only girl. And I wish this upon no one, not even my worst enemy do I wish this upon. And like an hour after my daughter, they confirmed that it was her, I went into her room and started breaking things. And then I got even more upset because I was breaking her things and I still was hoping she was alive even though I knew she wasn't. Investigators speculated on why Brittany's body had come to rest in a river 18 miles from her home. Lieutenant Jean Lowry asked Brittany's mother if the location seemed significant. And at that time, she had indicated that her father was an employee of the Milwaukee Railroad and had since been retired or disabled, and the family spent many summers at the Railroad Museum in Union, Illinois, a very, very short distance from where Brittany Martinez's body was found. Eddie Milka had spent time there as well. Investigators secured a warrant for samples of his blood, saliva, and hair. They were forwarded to the FBI lab so examiners could begin the lengthy work of DNA mapping. Milka's genetic profile would be ready for comparison to any foreign DNA recovered from Brittany or her clothing. A forensic dentist also took impressions of Milka's teeth. Investigators suspected the mold would match the bite mark found on Brittany's cheek. The dentist compared the cast to a blown up photo of the indentations on the victim's face. The two appeared to match. But due to advanced decomposition, the bite mark was distorted, so the dentist could not be absolutely certain Milka's teeth had made the mark. The results were inconclusive. Authorities still lacked the physical evidence needed to make an arrest. They obtained a warrant to search the impounded Lincoln Town car they believed Milka had used to drive Brittany to the river. Soil samples collected from the wheel wells were found to be too common to prove where the car had been. Investigators hoped something on the inside would be more promising. Among the clutter in the back seat, agents found a paper cup from a fast food restaurant. Its lid was stained red with what appeared to be blood. The lid also held a partial palm print that matched Eddie Milka's. Brittany's fingerprint, along with her mother's, were found as well. Matted in the fibers of the backseat floor mat, they found more red stains. Agents secured samples of fibers from the floor mat and upholstery. More than 140 items were collected from the car and forwarded to the growing caseload at the FBI lab. 
Since the lab would take months to complete tests, Lieutenant Lowry asked Brittany's relatives to recall if anyone had been injured inside the car. Brittany's maternal grandmother, Milka, remembered that the 11-year-old had had a nosebleed in the car on the day of a family outing. Brittany's other grandmother said she was also there that day, but did not recall the incident. The Milka family painted it as, yes, there was a bloody nose in the vehicle, and these circumstances occurred. The other side of the family painted a dramatically different picture, that there was absolutely no evidence of a bloody nose. Family members on the two sides were lining up against each other. The Milkas believed that Eddie could not have killed Brittany. The hardest part of this investigation is the fact that our suspect was a family member. That obviously causes family problems when you suspect another family member of being the suspect in a case. That became difficult to overcome because we wanted the family's cooperation and it's difficult for the family to keep cooperating when one of their own becomes a suspect. Though circumstantial evidence pointed to Eddie Milka, contradictory stories and no confirmed physical evidence meant that investigators might never be able to charge Brittany's uncle with her murder. By early December 1997, Six and a half months had passed since the body of 11-year-old Brittany Martinez was discovered in a river 18 miles from her home. Her uncle, 20-year-old Eddie Milka, was the prime suspect and agreed to provide tissue samples, though his side of the family believed he was not responsible. Without substantial physical evidence, it would be difficult for the FBI and local investigators to charge him with murder. Examiners at the FBI crime lab in Washington, D.C. had spent months sifting through hundreds of pieces of trace evidence collected during the investigation. Karen Lanning, a scientist in the FBI's trace evidence unit, received Brittany's clothing and coordinated the examination. The evidence was processed in one of our scraping rooms, which is a room where we put the ev items of evidence, victims and suspects are kept separately, items from a scene are in a separate room so that we're not contaminating anything. Lanning examined Brittany's socks, underwear, and jeans. Each item was scraped in the search for hairs or fibers foreign to the clothing. On the inside of the jeans, the examiner discovered one thin nylon fiber, a fiber distinctly different from the denim. She would compare the questioned fiber to a known sample from the carpet in Milka's car. The fibers matched. In four additional tests, her results were the same. Investigators theorized that Brittany had been in Milka's car with her jeans removed since the carpet fiber was found inside of her jeans. But the fiber match alone was not enough to prove the theory since that type of fiber was common to many cars. I couldn't say that the fiber came from that carpeting as opposed to another carpeting just like it. So if there were two cars um, that were the same, I can't say it's from car A versus car B. Investigators hoped the remaining evidence would prove more conclusive. Special Agent Melissa Smurf, okay. chief of the mitochondrial DNA unit two at the FBI laboratory, okay. was a serology and nuclear DNA examiner at the time. It was her task to determine if any of the victims or suspects' fluids were present on the evidence. She found Brittany's clothing too contaminated to test. Brittany had been dead for approximately nine days before she was found. Because of that, she had started to decompose, and the clothing that she had on her showed evidence of that decomposition. Agent Smurz instead focused on the red stains found on the fast food cup and carpet taken from Milka's car. She determined that the stains were human blood. Through DNA testing, she'd find out whose. 
the examiner compared known samples of Eddie Milka's and Brittany's DNA to that found on the cup and carpet. Agent Smurz concluded that the blood in the car had come from Brittany. The probability that someone else had bled on the cup was at least 6.4 million to one. It was enough to issue a warrant for Eddie Milka's arrest. On December 18, 1997, over seven months after Brittany disappeared, Eddie Milka was charged with murder, aggravated kidnapping, and predatory criminal assault of a child. His arrest took his sister, Wendy Howlett, by surprise. I not only lost my daughter, I am now losing my brother to something I know he didn't do. And I was more stunned and in shock than anything that, you know, this can't be happening. This, this nightmare has got to end somewhere. In order to protect her brother, Wendy Howlett said that it was unlikely that Eddie would have driven to the river in McHenry County since he had never been there before. She told Lieutenant Jean Lowry that the railroad museum the Milkas went to as kids was not in that area as she had previously stated. Wendy began to change her story for whatever reason and backed off on that statement that again forced us to re-interview her and try and determine you know where she was in regard to that statement because it it would be key in determining what the connection was to McHenry County. James McAuliffe from McHenry County State's Attorney's Office knew the trial would be difficult. Two of the key witnesses, Eddie's sister Wendy and Eddie's mother, would testify on the suspect's behalf. I have those expert reports. We had to impeach some very sympathetic people for whom our hearts went out, but we had no alternative because they had changed their story so much. So we had to, in effect, attack our own witnesses and members of the family who had suffered such a terrible loss. It made it extremely difficult for us. It made it extremely difficult for the Milka and Hallett family and all the members who testified. On April 21st, 2000, nearly three years after Brittany's death, the case of the state versus Edward Milka went to trial. The prosecution called more than 50 witnesses. In closing arguments, prosecutors told the jury how they believed the murder had taken place. They believed Eddie Milka had helped Brittany return her bike to the basement. In her haste, she left it unlocked, but took the cup she'd carried since coming home from her field trip. In the past, Brittany had sometimes accompanied her mother and uncle on cleaning jobs to help pay for the bike she loved so much. The prosecution believed Eddie drove to a nearby forest preserve after he saw his boss's car parked at work. There, prosecutors contended, he sexually assaulted his niece and likely smothered her until she died, then dumped her body in the Kishwaukee River. The defendant, Edward Milka. The jury was not convinced Eddie Milka had planned to kill Brittany. When the jury retired and they came back, they entered a finding of not guilty on the first degree murder. They felt that he had not intentionally murdered his niece. Felony murder. On the second charge of murder while in commission of a felony sexual assault, the jury found Edward Milka guilty. Many investigators, including Lieutenant Lowry, sympathized with Wendy Howlett's loss. The verdict provided little comfort to her family. This is a tragedy, a human tragedy. There's no other way to cut it. As a father, I can tell you, if I had to experience this, I don't know if I could survive it. So for her as a mother, my heart goes out to her. Edward Milka was sentenced to 75 years in the Illinois Department of Corrections. His crime tore a close family apart. When young Brittany was killed, no one could hear her scream. But with the FBI's forensic experts on the trail, the story of Brittany's final hours could be told. And her killer brought to justice.